Good evening and welcome to the October 14th, 2014 special, uh, regular meeting of the Troy Planning Commission. Copies of the agenda for tonight's meeting are available at the entrance to the room. Additionally, the agendas and minutes of prior meetings are available on the city's website. The meeting will be conducted in accordance with the agenda as presented or amended by the Planning Commission. The roles and responsibilities of the Planning Commission are outlined on the reverse side of tonight's agenda. State law establishes planning commissions. The commission is comprised of nine members, all of whom have volunteered to serve. Members are appointed by the mayor and confirmed by city council. The other individuals seated at the table this evening are representatives of the city's planning department, the city attorney's office, and the city's planning consultant, Carlisle Wartman Associates. If you wish to address the Planning Commission, please come forward when recognized and provide your name and address on the sign-in sheet. Please begin your remarks by stating your name for the benefit of the commissioners. All remarks are to be addressed to the Planning Commission, not to anyone else in the room. At this time, I ask that all cell phones, <coughs> Blackberries, PDAs, or any other devices that might disrupt this meeting, please either be placed in silent mode or be turned off. Ms. Uh, Zarnicki, the roll call, please. Ms. Cruz? Here. Mr. Edmonds? Yes, here. Mr. Gottlieb? Here. Mr. Hudson? Here. Mr. Krent? Here. Mr. Zanzika? Here. Mr. Shupke? Here. Mr. Strack? Mr. Tagle? Here. <laughs> Thank you. The next item is the uh, approval of the agenda. Can I have a resolution, please? Mr. Tagle. I'll second. Seconded by Mr. Kratt. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Mr. Gottlieb? Yes. Mr. Hudson? Yes. Mr. Krent? Yes. Mr. Zanzika? Yes. Mr. Shepke? Yes. Mr. Tagle? Yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. Next is the minutes of two uh, meetings. First was September 23rd. 2014, the minutes, a uh, special study meeting, and October 1st, 2014, special meeting. Is there a resolution for those minutes? Mr. Gottlieb? Do you want me to read it this time? No, no. no, no. <laughs> Move that they be accepted. <laughs> right. Is there support? support? Mr. Hudson? Mr. Gottlieb? Yes. Mr. Hudson? Yes. Mr. Krent? Yes. Mr. Zanzika? Yes. Mr. Shepke? Yes. Mr. Tagle? Yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Agenda item number four is public comment for items that are not on the agenda. Is there anyone in the audience who wants to speak to an item that is not on the agenda? Hearing none, we will move to item five, the preliminary site plan review, file number SP1000, proposed Penske Automotive Group parking lot expansion, north side of Maple, west of Stevenson, 1225 East Maple, Section 26, currently zoned IB, Integrated Industrial and Business District. Mr. Carlisle? Yes, uh, good evening to the Planning Commission. Um, Penske Automotive Group is requesting approval uh, for a preliminary site plan uh, for a 566 parking space vehicle storage addition to their existing site. <coughs> Um, the vehicle storage area is an accessory to their uh, principal use of the business and uh, which is used, the business is used for uh, automobile customization. Um, we do note that all vehicle customization must be located uh, within the existing building and there will be no customization as part of the associated increase in the parking area itself. Um, the existing area of the uh, parking lot addition is located behind the building and is currently mostly grass and broken asphalt. Um, the applicant is also proposing a stormwater management uh, detention pond um, as a buffer between the parking lot um, expansion and the single family residential adjacent to it. Uh, we do note that the applicant is adding a significant amount of impervious surface to the site and we do recommend that rather than simply providing a detention pond with steep slopes and a fence, we do encourage the use of more naturalized stormwater management. And this is actually a, um, uh, a uh, standard that's in the zoning ordinance uh, for stormwater management is the use of naturalized stormwater uh, systems. Um, part and parcel to the stormwater management is landscaping. 
Um, we do note that if the applicant is going to um, proceed with the stormwater detention as proposed, uh, they do need to provide a, a significant more, uh, significantly greater landscape buffer than, the, than they are currently proposing. Um, and they need to meet the requirement of one large evergreen tree every 10 feet or one narrow evergreen tree, uh, tree of every five feet. In addition to that, there is an existing landscape buffer along the property line uh, to the adjacent residential. We notice that it's um, rather unkept and unsightly. We do ask that the applicant supplement that and clean that up and replace the existing gaps to provide a full buffer along that property line. Uh, the last item for consideration is in regards to lighting. We do note, note that the lighting plan does not meet the ordinance requirements. Um, it appears that the lighting pole heights are greater than 25 feet. They can't exceed 25 feet. Um, the applicant needs to provide fixtures that are either fully shielded or full cutoffs. And lastly, they do need to reduce the parking, I'm sorry, the lighting levels along the western and eastern property line. That concludes our report. Any questions for the uh, planning consultant? Quick Mr. Craig. Ben, what, uh, can you expound on a little bit about the better water management than that steep slope? Uh, what, what's available for us for tools? Tools in terms of requirements well, or? No, no, not requirements, obviously. Okay. It's up, it, yeah. It, it, that meets the, the 20, that steep uh, retention pond or detention pond already meets our requirements, I take it. Correct. However, there is a standard in the stormwater management section of the ordinance which does encourage, we cannot require it, um, but it, it strongly encourages the use of more naturalized stormwater management. And simply because this is located adjacent to residential um, and they are adding such a significant amount of impervious surface, we, we encourage the applicant to consider uh, the use of more naturalized stormwater management, whether that be in the form of um, pervious paving for some of these parking spaces, since it's simply gonna be storing of vehicles out there, uh, rain gardens, bioswales, there are plenty of alternatives that the applicant can consider um, rather than just simply a steep and rather unsightly uh, detention pond with a with, uh, chain link fence around it. Do, do, are those solutions available for the appli applicant to review or look at to see what we have? We don't necessarily list anything in our ordinance. There are plenty of best practices that I'm sure the applicant is probably aware of that they can, they can incorporate. Good, thanks. Yep. Mr. Pitch? Yes, Mr. Hudson. Um, Brent, the recommendation says a tree buffer of one large evergreen per 10 lineal feet or one narrow evergreen per five lineal feet. What's the measurement? What's a large and what's a narrow? There's a, there's a uh, definition and it explains it in the zoning ordinance and the landscape standards of section 13, which I do not have in front of me, but I can, I can look up and tell you. It is defined then? It is defined, yes. So we can measure. Yes, yep. it's, it's clearly defined and based on species and size. It, it is in, again, article 13 of the zoning ordinance. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Uh, Tegel. Mr. Savinat, did you have any conversations with the petitioner before they submitted? Did they give you any preliminary uh, information or did they come in with any preliminary plans? We had some preliminary dialogue with the petitioner. Any of these topics discussed? Yeah, generally. I, I'm, I'm really surprised that there's this many items on the list. I mean, these aren't significant items for the most part, and uh, it just surprises me. Uh, it's a reputable firm uh, that there's this many items to be corrected. Yeah, and, and if, and I, I would agree with you, like in, no, in number, there's a lot, but what we felt was if there was significant items that were, that were going to hinder approvals or be contentious, we would have provided comments to the petitioner and, and had got plans revised. And, and, but because they were relatively insignificant in, in scope, we didn't do that. So it, there's, there's the appearance that there's a lot of items, but they are, they are in, <coughs> relatively insignificant, so. Thank you. And just for me, it, the petitioner has received a copy of the uh, of Mr. Carlisle's report. Yes. Mr. Uh, Gottlieb. So just to our staff, has the petitioner indicated their desire to meet those report conditions or no? It's, we have not had any conversation with the applicant post the drafting of the report and, and the sending out the report to them. They're, they're here, they can address, you know, address the issues of the commission. <clears throat> Mr. Sanzico. Yeah, there are so many issues that I have with the site plan. I don't, I wouldn't feel comfortable approving that tonight with all those conditions, especially regarding the stormwater management, the best management practices, 
to me, this is totally against what our philosophy should be for stormwater management and for development in the city of Troy. And, uh, and I really feel strongly about that. And uh, I think uh, to, to, uh, to allow something like this at this stage with, this, with insufficient information, with the landscaping, uh, uh, with negligible amount of landscaping, with no best management practices, practices for stormwater, I quite honestly couldn't have support a motion to approve the site plan. Anyone else? Okay. Ms. Cruz. Oh yeah, yes, yes. That comes up next. Yes. Ms. Cruz, can I get you to pull your microphone over? Uh, oh, yeah, just a little closer. Thank you. Okay, if there's no further questions, is the applicant here, please? Would you please come in and sign in, please? Good evening, my name is Jason Longhurst. I'm with Noack and Frouse Engineers, and I'm here tonight with Gary Bays from Penske Automotive Group. And uh, I guess we might as well just jump right in and start addressing some of the comments that came out in the letter. Uh, we did receive a copy of that letter last week, so we were able to have a, uh, a meeting earlier this week to discuss all of those comments and to prepare responses for you. Uh, if you'd like to start, we can start with the stormwater management issue. And one of the, the hurdles we have with this property is there's a 16-inch crude oil pipeline that runs north and south through the center of the property, and it actually bisects our proposed parking lot expansion. So what we've done is we've met with uh, Sunoco, we've gone out there, we've excavated that pipeline, and we found that the elevation of that is basically in direct conflict with any sort of stormwater, uh, storm sewer that we could put in. And there are also restrictions there that we can't do any grading. We can't lower the grade over top of that pipeline. So what we've had to do is we've designed a, a storm sewer system that actually is gonna have a, a siphon where the pipe is gonna to have to go underneath that storm sewer then it'll be raised back up and it'll outlet to our detention pond. The, uh, the detention pond has been designed for a 25 year storm event, which complies with city requirements. But due to the, the pipeline restrictions, we can't create a rain garden or some sort of longitudinal bioswale to drain across that pipeline because we can't lower those grades. Our, our hands are tied in that matter. So what we've done is we've located a detention pond over on the west side of the property to provide that additional buffer that was mentioned from the residence area, uh, just to give some additional screening, some additional setback from the cars. Um, and it's really the, the only alternate that we have. And we do comply with city requirements. We just aren't able to provide that, that BMP, um, you know, bioswale or rain garden because of the excavation requirements um, for the pipeline. Um, jumping into the, the landscape comments uh, that were mentioned, um, at our meeting earlier this week, and I think we've discussed with city staff, the uh, Penske Automotive Group has actually looked at that entire west property line uh, where the buffering was mentioned. And what they were proposing to do now is actually to remove the existing six foot chain link fence and to install a six foot wood obscuring fence along the entire property line. Not just the section where the new addition is going, but the entire property line. And what I've done tonight is I brought some pictures with me of uh, fence material that they've done on similar properties. If I can hand these out. Thank you. So what you've got in front of you is a, a picture of a similar fence that we've done on, on other properties. It's going to be a six foot high wood obscuring fence. It's going to run the entire length of the property line. And at the back of that packet, there's three pictures of the existing property line, the existing west property line, where you can see the chain link fence is in deteriorated condition. Uh, however, there is some mature and significant trees on that property line that were mentioned. So there are, uh, there's already a, a landscape buffer there. But what we're going to do is we're going to add that fence. And then as part of the parking lot, we're required to install 71 parking lot trees. And in our conversations with city staff again, uh, it was a recommendation that we take some of those 71 trees that are required as part of the addition and relocate them over to the west property line to fill in those gaps where the existing trees are. And Penske Automotive Group is supportive of that. Um, so that, that goes along to meet the, the, the wood fence meets the screening requirement in lieu of the, 
the one evergreen tree per 10 feet, and then we're going to go above and beyond that with the addition of those extra trees to fill in the gap along the residentially zoned properties where they wouldn't make as much sense along the north property line, which is an industrial property. And then relative to the, uh, the site lighting comments, uh, we have confirmed with our consultant all of the site light poles are going to be 25 foot in height. Uh, they are preparing cut sheets for them to illustrate that they're fully shielded. Uh, we will fully comply with the ordinance in that respect. And then also they're revising the light levels along the east and the west property lines to be below one uh, candle for power. Uh, I think they were just slightly above as part of the review. So that'll all be taken care of and we're uh, fully supportive of making those changes as part of this project. And then uh, I think the first couple of comments that were mentioned too is there was a concern about the, uh, there being any maintenance or repair of vehicles in the parking lot. And again, we've confirmed all work on vehicles will take place inside the building. The parking lot will just be used to store those vehicles. And then there was another comment about any uh, inoperable ve vehicles, scraps, materials of any kind being stored outside. And again, we've confirmed that all parts, scrap material will be stored inside the building and not in the parking lot. And we're committed to those responses. Uh, and with that. Mr. Savitt. Jason, could, could you or, um, or the gentleman from Penske, two, two questions, just I think it would help the Planning Commission. Uh, one, a, a brief summary of, of the operations on site, and two, an explanation of the need for the number of parking spaces that are <coughs> requested. Gary Bays, Penske Automotive. Uh, the business is a, if a car comes off the assembly line that has an issue and the manufacturers catch it before it gets on a truck going to a dealership, they ship them out to companies like we have there and they do the retrofit before it goes onto a truck and onto a dealership. And another phase of the business is a customized show car for one of the local OEMs uh, to do at the auto shows around the nation and around the world. So it's, it's not like your car dealership repair. It's, it's not a hot rod shop to say, but it's, you know, they may have 300 cars come in in one day and they may sit there for, and they run 20 in a shop, paint a door, fix the glass, fix the button, it goes out the other side, car hauler picks it up, puts it back in distribution, it goes on to another place, they bring another 20 in, it cycles through like that. And they run, they run two of the major brands that's home to Detroit. And then they, like I said, they do some other things, some custom work, but nothing outside. Uh, Mr. Mayor, what you talked about these two different, typical different types of activities. What is your estimate of the percentage of each of these type of activities? Do you do more customization work? Or I think do we do. I think we do more. Uh, right now, we're doing more um, uh, new car retrofit. Uh, I know it, the business that we, we that was there before we bought it out. They did. Um, they did a customized Jeep version. They bring in a, a Jeep Wrangler, put a pickup bed on it and out the door and it goes somewhere else. But I don't think we pick that up. I think we, we're mostly staying with uh, retrofits and, and, sh and custom. And we, and we have other places around this area that we do a lot of the custom car show equipment in also. Mr. Uh, Savita. And the, the, the need for the number of parking spaces? Like I said, if it's, if it's coming off the line, the la not the last time I was there, but a few weeks ago when I was there, they had probably 100 of a certain color of a minivan in the parking lot, and it was it was one of the doors was discolored, so that was a hundred that came off the line. So that's that's what they delivered there to get repaired and go out. Uh, as we know, as the recall is going on, it could be a hundred or five hundred or a thousand cars, and they want to get that. It's much cheaper to do that here locally before it gets to the dealer. So that's that's why the massive numbers there. And plus, we are picking up. Right now, we're doing one brand out there, and we're moving another business from another location into that with the second brand. So we'll be pushing two brands out at one location. So just to, just to clarify then, um, maybe put words in your mouth a little bit, you're kind of at the mercy of, of, of whatever happens on the assembly line or whatever the demand is for a certain that's, that's true. improvement. So 
maybe 100 show up today and maybe 200 show up tomorrow and ex you, you really don't know. We really don't know. I mean, and there again, it, it's the misfortune of the manufacturer of, is he has a problem. It's, it's where we make the money at. It's what is our business. And then we fill in, but like I say, with the custom show work there that we bring from the other shops. So if everything goes right on the assembly line, we're, we're pretty low. But if something happens, you know, if, I'm not going to call any parts, but the, the one door, it's not been a recall on the news. But anything like that, we, we take care of before it goes out. So if they catch any kind of window problem, door problem, paint problem, mechanical switch, anything, they can ship them out. And we're not the only ones that does it. We just have bigger contracts here. So it, it could be over a period of time, it could be 500 cars, but we probably wouldn't get 500 at one time. We'd probably get it, you know, in groups that we can handle. So and, it's part of, and it's part of our contract that, in, in any contract like this, that the new cars have to be parked on hard surface. So, so you have no control at all. We have no control. So they could call at 8 p.m. at night and say, you know, tomorrow morning we're bringing in 300 cars. It's probably more like 20 uh, car haulers a day. But, and then they start bringing those in. And they, and they have, once they come there, we have to have the part to, if it's a paint shop, we have a pretty good sized paint shop there, but if it's a part for a car, they have to have their fit before they send them to us. And I'm assuming that your paint shop meets all the uh, state requirements for uh, emissions? Yes. If, and we, we go through our own safety um, protocol within our company, so. And the ship of hazardous materials? Pardon? And the shipment of hazardous yes. materials? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Ms. Cruz, I'm sorry. I was just curious as you were describing potential for having 300 cars delivered to you at once or 200 cars or 50 cars, what exactly is your turnover rate per day? How many cars are you completing and removing from inside the facility and out to the parking lot in a day? It's kind, of, it's kind of based on the repair of the car. I mean, it could be a, if we get 300 cars, they're not, they're gonna bring so many, but they're not gonna overload us on the lot. You know, if we can park 200 cars per brand, if we get 400 cars in, it's cycled in. We have a pretty good sized shop. I don't know the square footage of it, but it's several thousand feet. They can bring a lot of cars in and go through the process <coughs> and get them, get them back out as quick as they can. Because we, we have to turn the car over to keep the manufacturer happy, plus the faster we do it, you know, the better off we are, too. So if we were to grant your um, 566 parking space addition on top of your 255 space existing lot, you're talking about potentially needing 800 spaces to do business on a daily basis? I don't think it would be. I don't a, think it would a be. A, I don't think it'd be a regular daily basis. But 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 by us not knowing what's coming, that's our expectation. So are you taking a rather safe than sorry approach? You'd rather have too many spaces and not need them than not have enough. I don't think so. I think we're. I think we're pretty close. I mean, we have a lot of employees there too, and I think it. That's part of the employees. I don't really know the employee count, but we have several employees there also. I don't think we're. I don't think we're 50 or 75 percent over what we're asking for. So, you know, two months ago when we were out there, they they were they were finishing up one group of cars to get them out, pushing them really hard to get them out because they're already done, so they could bring another another group in. And and I'm curious about your 20 car hauler a day statement. Do these car haulers come 24 hours a day, or are they limited to certain delivery times? I think most of the time they're during regular business hours because they've got, they've got to come from somewhere else. And I, I don't really know the answer to that question, but I wouldn't think it would be in the middle of the night. It's probably going to be scattered out through the days. And, <clears throat> and it could be, you know, it could be the most I've ever seen there at one time was two. So I might have over-exaggerated that, but, you know. It's just whatever comes to us at once, and they stock them, and then we get the parts and we move them out. But your normal business hours aren't 24 hours a day. What what hours do they, do your employees be there? Uh, are, I, are they there? I know it's at seven. I'd say seven to three thirty, seven to five. It's one shift. One shift. As far as, as far as I've know, I've never been there at night, and I don't. I'm construction manager. I'm not in that 
I know a, a little bit about the business, but not. But I don't think it's two shifts. Ms. Cruz, did you, did you have some other comments? I, I do, um, but I don't know if anyone else has any questions about the parking lot <coughs> situation before I would maybe move on to some of my other concerns and comments. Anyone else have questions, Mr. Sanzica? Yeah, I, um, I guess what I'm, you know, I, I understand the time of the year and, you know, the construction season is, is closing in on you that you, you know, when it comes to past November 15th, it's, it's unpredictable if you can get asphalt or construction equipment out there, out there and it's just a, a bad time of year to, um, to do that. But do you anticipate, you know, is, is that the urgency of the site plan is because of the construction season and uh, trying to get this done this, uh, this winter by before the winter sets in? Correct. We, we've actually submitted for uh, soil erosion and engineering concurrently with the site plan, just to try and expedite the process so that we could be out there and construct it this year. Yeah. We've had we've had meetings with planning, building, engineering as we've developed and gone through the process. Yeah, I don't. I'm not going to micromanage <laughs> or try to get into the design of the the site plan, but it just seems like there's just so many more things that you can do. For you know, uh, stormwater management, and best management practices, than to, to have all hard surface, and um, you know all the, for example, all the uh, the center islands, are they do they drain into the center islands or do they drain drain away from them? Is it uh, could you possibly put some type of rain garden in there with tree plantings and with with the the, the conflict that we have with that crude oil pipeline, any pipe that we put in our our outletting storm sewer is above where that pipe has to be to get to it. So anything that we did, if we were to try to do rain gardens in those center islands, they would just become a bathtub. They wouldn't have an outlet. Um, so we're trying to minimize that by doing a storm sewer, one crossing, and then the pond. So the pond acts as our buffer that it can fill up and then drain out into the city storm sewer. Um, but, with, but with having to go below that existing uh, pipeline, aren't you in effect just creating a trap we're, we're basically we're creating a siphon. It's, it's a trap. A, yeah. So water will come in, it'll sink down, and then water always finds a level. So the pipe on the other side is raised up again, and the water will, you know, drain out that way. It's going to be a maintenance issue. We've advised Penske about it, but it, it's the best solution for what we have and the restrictions we have with that pipeline. Did, did Penske look at actually two different, one on each side of the pipeline? Two separate systems? Our, our only outletting storm sewer is on the, the west side of the property. There's a 30 inch storm sewer out there that we have to discharge to. <coughs> did you, um, I mean, Mr. Yes, Chairman, please. did you look at porous pavement? Not I'll give you a good example Ford Motor Company at the Rouge plant <coughs> for their new car uh, assembly line uses porous pavement uh, for stormwater management because, because it's an ideal situation. The cars are clean, they come off the assembly line. There's not road salt. There's not dirt on the vehicles, and and porous pavement does require some maintenance, and occasionally they vacuum it. But yep, and, and again, and I, I wondered if you if, if even looked at that at all to, to try to determine that. Yeah, that we, was we've it. done it on on several other projects, um, but here the same thing is the porous pavement relies on groundwater infiltration. If it exceeds the capacity that's coming to it, we have to give that an overflow somewhere. And to get a pipe under that pipeline again is going to be a problem. So that water would just sit, and we create ponding issues. Mr. Godley. Just to, it's kind of a shift from the question to the petitioner, but does our staff looked at this plan and said they didn't think that recommendation of what your proposed solution was was acceptable. Do we have other options available to us is the question. Has, has our staff been informed of that pipeline and is there still something available other than that high-pitched drainage system? Our, our engineering department would be aware of of the pipeline situation. So I mean, I'm not an engineer, so I don't get into the, the fine details of, the, of this type of thing. Because I don't want to micromanage either, but if we've got staff that's already looked at it and said that there's alternatives to that system that's been presented to us, I guess they should be at least explored. But I think part of the process, Mr. Gottlieb, is that these applications come in and they're submitted to all the respective departments, including engineering. And if they sign off saying it's okay, then that's about as far as it goes. 
Am I correct? Well, the, you're, yeah, you're correct. <laughs> Mr. Scott, or uh, Mr. Sensei. I was just curious, d does this site plan, when it's currently designed, does it meet the, the, the zoning ordinance, or requirements for our ordinance? Does it, as currently designed, does it meet the zoning ordinance? It the pavement, not necessarily the trees and all the other items that you referenced, but is it? Uh, uh, the, yes. Mr. Uh, Tangle. It probably meets the engineering standards, but I don't see the creative response to the stormwater management that's in the ordinance. I do not disagree with that statement. And I'm not an engineer either, but I'm not yet connecting the dots between your pipeline issue and creating an, a, 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 or creating a more designing, more creative stormwater management plan. I mean, I, from what you've explained here, you've got something that bisects the site. You've already crossed the pipe pipeline in one spot, if I'm understanding Correct. what you said. Yep. And I don't know why you can't have the stormwater, some creative stormwater management techniques on both sides and on the side that you have to cross over, cross it in one spot, collect it and cross it in one spot, just as you're doing in the, in the uh, plan you have here. The, the way that the site grades out, there are, there are multiple drainage areas in there. It doesn't all drain to the north to one area. Well, so it must drain to the one pipe that crossed on your east end. It must drain to one pipe where it crosses under the pipeline. We've, we've taken the two, there's two sets of catch basins that run across the site. Mm -hmm. We've combined those two into one pipe so that we just have one crossing right. on the east side. Right. But the restrictions with the pipeline are that we, we can't change grade over top of that pipeline. So I can't I extend that. a swale. I can't do, I can't do the, any other, you know, other than what we're basically showing. It's. If what I'm understanding, I'm, what I'm not getting is you're looking at this as one single parcel or area to drain, as opposed to looking at it as two separate areas to drain and make the connection at one linkage point. We, we'd have to provide that 25-year detention. So somehow right. we have to be able to maintain that flow through there. And if I can't do it with, with swales because of the, the grading requirements. And if I were to, to do one pipe underneath it, uh, a size of a pipe for a 25 year storm for the, the east half would, you know, we need a, a 60 inch pipe, it'd be 15 feet deep to get under the pipeline. Well, as others have said, I don't want to sit here and micromanage, I don't want to sit here and, and help try to engineer this thing, but I don't see the creative response in the stormwater management, even with the pipeline that's shown in the plan. No, I've been on the commission for, uh, you know, just maybe four or five years. I don't ever recall anything, this type of an expansion of parking. In fact, in most businesses, they come in and ask for a parking reduction. Um, and to put in that much additional asphalt, I, I have a real problem with it. You know, that, and I don't think you've convinced us, at least for me anyway, that the increased business will require eight or 900 parking spaces out there that's going to be used on a regular basis. Do you, I, I, as a commissioner, I would have to see further evidence that that's, that's where you're at. We didn't see, receive any report as to, you know, what, what the number that you're going to need on an ongoing basis. probably 60 or 70 employees out there now. We plan on probably putting on some more employees. And then the business, that's the model we're setting. That's what the business we're trying to bring to this area. So, you know, if it is what it is, I mean, that's the way we designed the, the parking lot was to fit the model of the business. So all of your other operations have this type of parking available to them? Pretty much, and we're actually we're bringing. We, there was already a business there, and we're bringing another business into it. So we're we're like doubling up on the business we're bringing into it. Well, doubling up would not be 800 sparkling spaces. So uh, I'm kind of in agreement with what, I, with what I hear some of the other people. I think we're going to need a lot of further evidence that that there is this kind of need, and I also agree that we you need to do some type of creative. Uh, you got residential 
on the westerly border there. So uh, the other question I had uh, would have for you, six foot fence is not a huge fence. Do you need all that or are you willing to put in a, a landscape berm on the westerly property line? The, right, or an eight foot fence? Yeah, on the, the west property line, if you look at the, there's pictures in the back of that packet there, there's the, the existing chain link fence and you can see that entire property line is vegetated with mature trees, uh, that the entire length of it. So what we're looking to do is take out the dilapidated chain link fence to install that six foot permanent obscuring fence that's gonna be a drastic improvement from what's out there now. Maybe, there, to, do a, to do a berm or anything like that along the property line, we'd have to take down all of those trees. Just one further point, many of those existing trees have been allowed to grow through that existing fence. And we've had other properties that that, that same thing exists. Um, are they your trees or are they the abutting property? I think the intent, I'll speak. I think, I think it's, I think we trimmed, we've trimmed and cut everything back on our side to clean it up. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably, it's probably trees that's on the property line itself. It could go both ways. Some of them are mature trees that, you know, we didn't cut. We, trimmed and cut everything on our side. So they don't belong to either side? I've never heard I really of that. couldn't say how, if it's on the property line, who it belongs to, but if it's a mature tree, we didn't want to take it out because we didn't want to open it up to the It all depends where the roots go through the ground. That's who owns that tree. Ms. Cruz, I'm sorry, you're next. I'm just curious, out of all of the options available to you to create a buffering zone on that west side of the property that is adjacent to the residential, why you decided that a wooden fence was your best option? We've used it in other places. It's, it's pretty much, you, you can't see through it. It's a, it's a shadow box fence, you can't see through it. Uh, some cities have masonry walls. It's basically, you can't see through it. I don't, the ordinance call for a the, the six foot fence is allowed in the ordinance. Mm -hmm. Six foot fence is allowed in the ordinance, so. Mm -hmm. and, and who's going to stain it and maintain it and make sure that it looks nice? We will. On an ongoing basis? We will. You know, because I, I think that there are composite materials too that are, are look like wood, and I don't know if that fits in with our, our ordinances, but I am concerned about the deterioration of the wood over time. I'm just, I'm not convinced that that's the best option to create the buffer between the west property and the um, residential area. Mr. Shepke, did you have something to say? Sure do. Anyway, I think what's confusing a lot of us, uh, I didn't see in this drawing a set of uh, mechanical uh, stormwater drawings with invert elevations on the piping and an invert elevation on the other, on the, uh, the gas piping going through there so that we can make a, a you know, we can get a better concept, usually a, a set of mechanical a plan view, at least if not isometric drawings are, are sent out with a, with a uh, when we have any kind of a conflict like this. And, and that gives us a better idea so that we know that we're not talking through our hat. But uh, right now, uh, Brent, is engineering signed off on this right now? Uh, with, yes. With the, they have signed off, so I, I guess I take, maybe technically we can't do anything about it, but it, it makes it easier for us to understand when we're looking at uh, something that, that, that actually puts a, an image in front of us, because it's, it's tough when you just show the, uh, the retention pond and maybe where the catch basin, basin uh, uh, drains are at, uh, I mean, it, it's pretty hard to see why we couldn't get another set of lines down there or something. So you're running into problems because it's almost an incomplete, uh, maybe not for engineering, but it's incomplete for us. So it's pretty hard for us to wrap our wrap our arms around it. So uh, I like I like the idea of the fence, but again, uh, I I think maintenance on a kind of fence like that, even on womanized womanized turns nasty after a while if it's had a semi-transparent stain or something on it. But right now, uh, those trees along that uh, cyclone fence are, <laughs> they're very eyesore and they're not gonna stop any light or any 
in any light whatsoever. So I think anything's an improvement, but a, a maintenance on a, on a garden, I mean on a fence like that's very important. But I think that if we had a mechanical plan view drawing with invert elevations uh, on the piping and that, that would really help us a lot. And, and I, I thank you very much. Uh, anybody else? Mr. Craig. Um, what are the materials, what, what is the material of the wood? What kind of wood is going to be used on that fence? I think it's been cedar in the past. Uh, it's cedar. Cedar, okay. We, we, could do, we could do a chain link with plastic slats. If right. That, yeah. If that's, yeah. You know, Penske has always had a really high level of quality. Everything they do is high, high end. And uh, I just wanted, and if you meet all the ordinance requirements, I, I can't say no. I mean, it's just, you meet all the requirements. But I was just hoping that some of the suggestions as far as incorporating some uh, better water management practices could be looked at by you. I know that you've got a deadline coming up and all this stuff and redo drawings, that's, that's gonna be tough to meet your uh, asphalt deadline and all those things. But I just was hoping that uh, the, the company itself, Penske, of that high quality level would look at this and say, you know, we could do a little better here and I would just like to see a better water management, a better, more creative approach, if possible. Ms. Cruz. Um, just to piggyback onto what Mr. Krent has said about Penske, and, and it's true, I mean, Penske around here is a big name, and it, it's a high quality name, and people have come to have certain expectations when you hear Roger Penske's name. And I went out and I visited the site yesterday and I took a look at, at what is existing, and um, I visualized what it is that you're proposing. And to be honest with you, my takeaway was I was extremely underwhelmed. I think that Penn State <coughs> has the opportunity to take a very tired industrial area and to turn it into a showcase industrial area. And what I'm seeing on this report is that you're willing to do the bare minimum to meet our ordinances and to meet the code requirements, but you don't seem to be very willing to do something that's a little above and beyond. You're not willing to do something that creates a showcase industrial space. And just because something is industrial doesn't mean that it has to also be unattractive. It could be a very aesthetically pleasing site on a main road here in Troy, and you could plaster the Penske name all over it, and people would be thrilled. But the lack of um, creativity, maybe, that has, that has gone into this is, for me personally, it's, it's a little underwhelming. But like Mr. Mr. Krentz said, we haven't, we haven't um, we're not at a point where if you meet all the ordinance requirements, we can say no. But I certainly would hope that you would take to heart some of our concerns and comments here today about what we would really like to see. We'd like to see you set the bar. We'd like to see you be outstanding. I think we have used a fence in quite a, we have used a fence in quite a lot of other places where we could have gotten away with chain link, I think, and I think chain link and plastic slats would probably be permissible here. I think the, 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 the wood fence is a step up. If you asked us to use the composite on it, we can go back and look at that one. I personally, I don't care for it, but if that's what if that's what the council wants, that's that's what it has to be. But uh, I think the bar will be raised. We've already cleaned the place up. If you'd have saw it two three months ago out back, you would have you would have saw that. And then we've painted the building since we've been there. Uh, we're working on upgrades for inside the building, which will be coming later on for approval. Um, we're also going to repave the front parking lot that'll be coming along later with a different approach to Maple. Uh, I think over a period of time, you're going to see those improvements. But in order to get this business off the ground, this is what we need to get started. I mean, um, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, and this certainly is not Rome, but we're going we're gonna to be there. It may take us a while to get there. It's, it's, a, it's a business that we, we bought out and uh, we've already made improvements and we'll continue to make improvements. So if, if, if you don't like the wood fence, then I can change it to chain link and, and plastic slats, but uh, to me, that's less than wood. And if you want composite, we can 
I can take that back and see what we come up with that. So, Chair, Mr. Sanzico. I, I, I guess there's so many issues that are unresolved. I, I guess I'd like to ask the, the attorney and staff if uh, if we were to uh, postpone this, to do we have to postpone to a, a date certain, or could we ask the petitioner um, would he can meet with the staff and, and potentially uh, revise the plans and, um, and submit a complete set of drawings? I'll, I'll answer, then I'll let Alan correct me. <laughs> So we would prefer either postpone to a date certain or postpone to a like a measurable action, you know, postpone until such time that the petitioner can give us revised plans, though it give us a chance to review to go back to planning commission, something like that. But again, Alan will correct me for what I just said. Uh, no correction needed. <laughs> that, that, it doesn't have to be a date certain. It could be based on a specified event, uh, but there should be some basis for the postponement that to give the petitioner some idea of what you're looking for. Uh, you have to, some sort of basis based on the ordinance. For instance, if you don't think they've met a certain requirement under the ordinance, you could postpone it to provide verification that they've met that requirement, just so the petitioner has some idea of what you're looking for. Mr. Godley? So if I understand the process correctly, my objection to the th process was that our staff had made a recommendation that it did not meet the guidelines or the ordinance as it relates to the stormwater retention. And the reason I was questioning that, just so you understand, is I agreed with the negative impact of the steep wall storm water retention setup adjacent to the residential area and you know it just kind of makes me go back to the we had the same pond adjacent to uh, Athens High School on John R and you know it was a tragic accident a young fella got in there and uh, died in there because you know he supposedly couldn't get out so my concern related to the fact if there were an option with respect to how you could eliminate stormwater I wanted our staff to have that option to say, yeah, this is a really good thing and we support it. If our staff supports it, I'd support it. So if you want a certainty for uh, whether I'd support it, I'd support it if our staff supported it, it does, if that addressed that, that concern or not. I just want to make sure I understand, but I, and I think I do. From engineering standards, which the city engineering department looked at this, it meets the engineering standards. We're not the engineers. We don't call the engineering standards. The plan, the zoning ordinance though, has different standards. Creative stormwater management techniques. They haven't met those in my opinion. And so that's, where, that's the problem I have. I'm not suggesting that their engineering is faulty. Our group, our engineering group has said, yes, it meets the engineering standards. I don't think it's a creative solution, and that's where I'm struggling with this. Oh, I, I didn't question the engineering component, only the... Well, I've heard several comments that if it meets the standards, we have to approve it. It doesn't meet the standards. Well, I didn't say it for... But it doesn't meet the standards, in my opinion. Mr. Uh, Savitt. Yes. So this is, a, this is a, an interesting application, because what we're, the, the spaces we're talking about are not... It's not off-street parking per se. In other words, it's not required parking by ordinance for, for staff and, and guests. It's, it's not. It's for basically parking vehicles that are essentially showroom ready with some, you know, some minor tweaks required. Um, so we really don't, we, we really haven't been given accurate information in terms of, of what the need for the number of parking spaces is. We've, we've been given anecdotal information this evening um, and saying, suggesting that they, they likely need this many spaces, but we don't have anything scientific. And I don't mean a 25 page dissertation. I mean something that clearly lays out how many spaces they need. Because as Mr. Tegel is alluding to, we do have a requirement in the zoning ordinance for off street parking that says you can't exceed off street parking, required off street parking by 20%. So we're in a gray, a, a, a kind of a no man's land here. We've never gone down this road before. So we don't know where the, where the off street parking ends and, the, and the, the vehicle parking begins. We, 
so to be consistent with, with, with the ordinance provision, it is fair, I believe, for the Planning Commission to, to ask for, for a validation for the number of spaces. I think that's fair, given, given the provisions in there related to off-street parking. Um, at the same time, we do have language in the ordinance that strongly encourages the, re the use of sustainable stormwater practices. Um, the, the information that was provided by Mr. Longhurst this evening was helpful, um, but it's still, you know, it's still kind of unclear as to, you know, have they, have they taken this as far as they can take it? And, and um, so I guess, I guess what, it sounds like what the Planning Commission is asking in terms of moving forward and giving the, the applicant direction is, is, is verification of the number of, the need for the number of spaces that are, that are requested. And then um, an, an explanation of, of um, you know, is this, is this the best you can do in terms of, of sustainable stormwater management? And if so, why? I think that's fair. I would agree. And, 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 um, the, the th thing I'm, I'm sure you're aware of is that if you needed something less than the 800 and some odd parking spaces, you would have the option to not have a steep walled retention pond back there in the back. You could do the low slope. Yes, it would take a little more area. Yes. But if you, you know, sacrifice some of those parking spaces that, for me, I don't think you've justified. And the, the detention pond, it's a one on four slope. The ordinance standard is a one on six. A one on four is still maintainable with the lawnmower. It's not a, a one on three, one on two. And what we are proposing to do is the, the new wood fence along the property line. We're gonna be fencing the other sides of the detention pond as well. So if there are safety concerns, that, that's also gonna have a six foot fence there. But the, the, the steep slope is, I think, is misleading because it's, it's a one on four. It's still something you can drive a lawnmower over. It's not a, a, a tripping hazard. It's just steeper than the one on six in the ordinance, which requires the fence, which is, is where we're at. <clears throat> Anyone else? Yeah. Mr. Edmonds, if I may. Yes. Um, I guess I'd like to read ordinances and see if what the applicant says meets the ordinance. <clears throat> I have no problem with the engineering. I think it's clear. The engineering department's passed on it. It's acceptable by the ordinance. When we get into an area of satisfying creativity in a project, that is such a slippery slope, an ambiguous standard, I don't think that uh, depending on the composition of this council, anyone could meet it. So I'm opposed. I think this is a project, while we may not like some of the design, some of the concept they've used, and they've ignored some suggestions as to uh, best management practices. It's not a requirement, though. It's a suggestion. And I think Ms. Cruz probably summarized my thoughts very correctly in her disappointment with some of this. but. I'm opposed to uh, adjourning this. I, I think they've met the standards and I would reluctantly vote for its approval. Mr. Well, I'd like to make a motion, if I may, yes. Chairman. Like, uh, a motion to table the um, proposed site plan uh, for the reasons of uh, asking the, the applicant to provide validation of the number of parking sites for, uh, for the proposed development Explanation of sustainable stormwater management and, and looking at alternatives for the site plan. Look at alternative uh, screening uh, of the fence along the, the west property line. Uh, confirming that pole height does not ex exceed 25 feet in height. Provide lighting cut sheets to confirm that the existing features are fully shielded or, or full cut off. Um, provide a tree buffer of lar one large evergreen for 10 feet or narrow evergreen per five feet, lineal feet on the outside of the detention or, or alternate if uh, so applicable and uh, supplement the existing landscape uh, buffer along the westerly property line, additional trees where they are, where there are existing gaps. Is there support for the resolution? Mr. Gottlieb, any further discussion? If not, the roll call please. Ms. Zarnicki. No. Mr. Krantz? Yes. Mr. Danzica? Yes. Mr. Shefke? No. Mr. 
Tagle? Yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Mr. Cotton? Yes. Motion passes. May I ask yes, a question? Please. Now, on the, the, the requirement that we were describing for the fence and for the trees along the buffer, my, my understanding on the ordinance is it's one or the other. You either have to do a fence or you have to do trees. You don't do both. There, so the, the trees are a requirement. Um, there's also provision in the ordinance where there are two, um, for lack of a better term, incompatible uses. The Planning Commission has the discretion to require a fence or wall as in addition to trees. Because yeah, we're, we're looking at the right up here and it says, right here, screening, opaque fence, wall, or one large evergreen per 10 feet or narrow evergreen. That's in the landscape section. There's also another section that does require, it, the Planning Commission has the discretion to also um, require a, a wall or a fence in addition to landscaping as well. And then, I guess, to go along with that, then uh, recommendations as to a product for that. You know, we can, I think we've offered several examples of what we're willing. Is there something that's preferred? That we From my point, I can just tell you I don't, I would certainly not uh, be in favor of a, a chain link fence, even with slats. So. so, and then we had the wood fence, so. And I would prefer an eight foot fence, but that's something that you would have to offer. Right, I guess I guess I'm just I looking think you for should it. with staff and review it with staff and then provide cut sheets of what you you may propose w would this to the be, planning commission would this be something that we could take your recommendations and have staff approve we we already passed the motion to table until we these issues are submitted and allowing asked, but mr. Yeah. Santiki, he's asking a question yeah what is does the Planning Commission have any preferences as to mm -hmm. the type of fence? Ms. Cruz. I guess I'm the one that, that made the comment about the fence. My, my fence concern with it being wood is just the maintenance. I think that wood is probably the fastest to disintegrate. And so my concern was that it would just be well maintained. If you're gonna build the wood fence, I have to know that I'm never gonna look at it and think, why is it leaning this way or that way? Or why is it all gray? I mean, that it's just gonna be properly maintained. That, that was really my concern, mm -hmm. as opposed to say a brick wall. Right, and, that, and we're happy to make the statement that it'll be maintained and have it contingent to the, the approval. So I, I guess I need direction of what we should come back Mr. with. Chairman, if, if I may, I, I'm gonna oppose having a vote of the commission on every item which may be called for, be it a fence or a tree or whatever. I think the motion's been passed. They haven't come back and give us some more specifics. And if there's gonna be a problem, deal with it at that time, instead of voting tonight on fences. Yeah, I think it's difficult. I, I would agree with you, uh, Mr. Hudson, that you know to make recommendations on every single thing that's been part of the conditions of the uh, ordinance that, or the resolution which we did not pass, then I think is a little out of line. I would agree. Mr. Tate. Just a final thought on the fence. When you do come back, please be prepared to tell us how you've handled the property line situation, the trees that will be destroyed, and are the neighbors okay with this? We've had this issue before with fences on property lines and trees being on the property line. And what, you know, is a neighbor gonna say, don't cut my tree down? Or are we gonna be able to, what are we gonna do? So just be prepared to, when you propose the fence, tell us about the resolution, not just the aesthetics or the maintainability, but you know, what are the neighbors gonna do? What are you gonna do? Can you put it in there? How many trees are you gonna to have to cut down to put it in? Certainly. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can we talk about the eights? Yeah. Next item is uh, agenda item number six. Potential preliminary site plan application. Potential multifamily residential development, the southeast corner of Maple Road and Axtell, located at 2785 West Maple, Section 32, currently zoned IB Integrated Industrial and Business District. Um, Thank you, Mr. Carlisle. Yes. Um, 
I did write a memo, and it was included in your packet, um, and I did have a discussion with the applicant on Friday about it, so they did receive our memo and have some responses back to it. So I'm not going to go over any detail about what I did put in my memo. Um, this is a study session, so it's an attempt to be a little more informal. We usually have it in the other room, um, but I, I, I'm hoping this could be a little more of an open dialogue with the Planning Commission, our, the city staff, as well as the applicant. Um, just for a little background on what the applicant is proposing. Um, they are proposing the redevelopment of the nine-acre McGregor um, site. Um, they are proposing seven apartment buildings, uh, with each building being 36 apartment units for a total of 252 total units on site. Um, in regards to master plan, the site is located uh, within the transit center area of the 2008 master plan. And that plan called for really three key items for this particular area. And the first is a, um, a high-density mixed use um, area, which is in close proximity to the transit center um, and the business airport. Uh, the area is to become a lively village for residents and business customers, as well as a uh, potential limitation on surface parking. In addition, we do note that this site is located within the draft 2014 Maple uh, Road Corridor Plan, which the Planning Commission recently considered. Um, and for, for this area um, applicable for this site, the plan called for um, commercial and mixed-use development within proximity to the major mile intersections. And we do note that this site is within a quarter mile of the Maple Road Coolidge um, node and three quarters of, of a mile from the recently opened uh, transit center, uh, which happened today. So congratulations to the city on that. Um, we do note that the location of this parcel in relation to the transit center, as well as just the nine acre size of this parcel, really is a key and important site into the redevelopment of Maple Road. I, I, Brent and I went back and racked our brains and tried to look at sites that are this large for development options in Maple Road, and there are few and far between for this importance. Um, that being said, we do find the applicant is making a significant investment in the site, and they do meet many of um, what we're trying to, to achieve in Maple Road. However, um, with that being said, we do think there's a unique opportunity here that maybe um, the application of a little more creative site planning would, would do the applicant um, some good moving forward. We did list about nine items in our report for consideration by the applicant, um, but there's really two that we find that are really driving the site, for lack of a better term. The first is really the orientation and the layout of the site. Um, as noted, the site is large enough for more creative site planning, and we do note that the current access and layout is very auto-oriented. It really does not lend itself to the pedestrian um, and pedestrian orientation of the site. Um, what we are, um, we would ask the app to consider is more using more of a grid type system internally. Um, and this is really characterized by the, in, the uh, incorporation of a, what we call a main, a main street or a main uh, boulevard that, that bisects the site. Um, with this urban, and we're calling it more of an urban street, with this urban street, um, you could incorporate a variety of housing products, um, some on-street parking, the use of sidewalks, more pedestrian and urban amenities, um, and also may uh, lend itself to doing some more mix of uses along that frontage. Um, and lastly, we do note that uh, the gap in the street wall in Axtell as, as proposed does not really frame Axtell as we would like to see uh, moving forward. So at a minimum, we'd like them to consider moving that one building closer to Axtell. Um, we do note that just due simply to the massing of the buildings, um, there is a little bit less flexibility in terms of orientation. So we do encourage the applicant, if they're going to proceed with the design, to consider smaller buildings to allow for more flexibility. In exchange, you can have alternative, you can have additional smaller buildings <laughs> to compensate for the loss in the number of units. We're not caught up in the number of units per se, but more how the orientation of the layout of the site is proposed. Um, the other, the other um, significant issue is the orientation and the, the, the image that it presents on Maple Road. Um, we're asking the applicant to consider a more dynamic use um, of that property along Maple Road, whether it's be more urban streetscape, different uses, something to be more lively. We just don't find that the, f the first floor of parking to be an appropriate frontage on Maple Road, and so we're asking for a little more creativity along that long length of Maple Road. Um, we do note that there are other minor issues, and that's in regards to landscaping and stormwater management, et cetera. But we do find that the development of the site really is driven by the proposed layout, and we think that there should be alternative and, and more creative solutions uh, proposed by the applicant. So again, this is uh, open for discussion and, and any questions from the Planning Commission. 
I've got one. I'm sorry. I'm looking at the proposed layout of the uh, the roads as it's been sort of redesigned uh, report. I see a problem we've always had with stem sections on roads where you've got uh, two dead ends in front of one that looks like a building and the other looks like a parking area. With snow removal, where are you going to pile the snow if it's uh, a dead end there? This is, uh, Mr. Huston, this is my crude attempt at trying to be a, a land planner here. Well, yeah, I do um, very well, but I'm, I'm not suggesting. Yeah, um, the, 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 Obviously, the, the grid layout would have to be a reorientation of the site. Where the buildings are shown or overlaid on this, the street system overlaid on this plan does not relate to how the buildings are currently oriented and laid out. Um, there are ways to handle, to handle snow, snow removal in, in stub streets. You can, you can push it towards the end of the landscape buffer. So um, I, I don't think storm, or snow removal or snow storage is really um, a major concern at this point until we get into the more of the details of what they're proposing. Anyone else for the uh, consultant? If not, is the applicant present? Please come in and come forward and sign in, please. Put it internal. Good evening. My name is Stephen Schaefer. I'm from Schaefer Development, uh, 29800 Middle Belt, Farmington Hills, Michigan. And uh, we're uh, pleased that we were able to come in for a preliminary uh, discussion with the Planning Commission. Uh, we, we think we're uh, proposing a uh, very unique type of uh, product that uh, currently doesn't really exist in the market. And I think uh, uh, communities are all about diversity of housing. And I think, you know, um, I'm going to talk about who we're targeting for this project and why we think it would be good for the community. Uh, about six months ago, I came into the city and uh, met with Brent. I, I was looking at another site that Magna had. There's some residential that's way in the back. And we thought, well, it's along the highway. We'd like to do something with some height. Uh, because today we see the market as being a very um, heavy empty nester type market. And empty nesters typically don't like to have a lot of stairs. So uh, we wanted to try to design a building that would work well for uh, that market uh, where there's not a lot of uh, stairs and also uh, incorporates some covered parking. Uh, these buildings are basically set up uh, with parking on the main floor on grade. Uh, there is a parking spot uh, underneath the uh, building, and then there's a central corridor or a lobby that you go to. And then uh, once you enter that lobby, you're able to go up to the particular floor that you live on. And uh, the 36 um, unit building has uh, nine units uh, per floor. Uh, they vary from one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom units. Uh, one bedroom units do have uh, a den option. Uh, a lot of nice, very, uh, very nice um, windows as well as balcony space, uh, outdoor balcony space for all the uh, units. The second floor units actually have verandas. Um, on the end, if you notice from the elevation, uh, the uh, second, third, fourth, and fifth floor kind of pull in a little bit um, over the building. So it creates a uh, very nice outdoor space for um, some of the units on the uh, second floor. And, um, you know, it's, it's a higher end type unit. Uh, this construction uh, is uh, obviously more expensive than the garden style apartments that you typically see. And um, we think that uh, the look and the style and the materials, uh, this is something that, you know, will wear the test of time. And, and you know, it's a very uh, exciting intersection. You have a lot of retail, great retail there. I mean, shopping, I mean, you have every retailer um, within walking distance pretty much from here uh, if you want to take uh, a bit of a walk. Uh, and uh, we think that this would really add to the area. I think our pedestrian areas that we really want to try to focus on are along Maple and along Axtell. And I assured um, Brent, uh, uh, you know, that we would um, look to try to achieve that. And, you know, in this forum tonight, we can sort of discuss some of the positioning, what we need to do before we get too far, uh, because this is a project that we would like to try to initiate with you um, in the next year, uh, hopefully next building season. And we think there's a tremendous market, you know, a lot of people who live in a home, the kids have moved away, they want to scale down, they're in Florida maybe five, six months of the year, and this offers a great alternative to stay within the community, to be close, um, 
uh, to Troy and Birmingham is just fabulous. You know, you have great things up on, uh, uh, you know, up by the mall, and uh, it's close proximity to Birmingham. There's a workout facility nearby, so there's some really good synergy. You know, we understand there's a, you know, we're surrounded by a lot of industrial properties. Uh, some of them are getting redone. Our neighbor, it looks like, is uh, commencing some construction. You know, we're excited about it. Uh, we do have some uh, decent perimeter trees that are uh, very um, mature. Uh, if you're familiar with the site, the McGregor's, um, uh, built this site back in the 60s, and they operated there uh, for a number of years, and uh, they have since closed down, and they're basically using the building uh, as storage, and the site was very underutilized. Uh, so it's really a jewel on it. You know, there's, a, there's um, uh, a nice piece of property here to create some critical mass. So, um, you know, we do welcome the opportunity to present this, uh, Mark Abernath is here, and he can kind of talk about um, our logic about how we set it up. And I do have some alternatives that, since the comments, I do have some just black and white drawings. They're not colored drawings, but with some little bit different positioning of the buildings to sort of maybe get some feedback to see how we can tweak <laughs> the plan to uh, accomplish, you know, the goals of uh, the community. You know, we're really excited about the transportation center, the airport. Uh, that's nearby, it attracts maybe a certain element that's looking for, to have a plane nearby, um, walking distance from a unit, you know, they're very mobile and, um, but the, you know, the rents are gonna be in the higher end of the, the spectrum. Um, you know, you have another very successful development in town called Regency Park, which is a higher end uh, rental community that's done very well and we think that uh, we can seize on that market and uh, this will be something that's new, that's fresh and uh, we're very excited about it. So we're anxious to hear your feedback. If you have any questions further, I'll, I'll answer those for you. And if you'd like Mark to sort of talk through uh, the original thoughts on the plan and then we can look at some alternatives. Please, please go ahead and stay right there at the mic because I'm sure we will have questions. Questions for the uh, petitioner, please. Well, I will certainly kick it off with, uh, so what is your uh, response to the recommendation about perhaps having one building up on the Maple Road side be with retail in the lower level? Uh, well, we, um, we originally had proposed that, and what we did is we did some perspectives where um, we felt that we could probably sacrifice some of the main floor parking that's underneath the building in one or two of the buildings. We like to have at least one covered spot in a building, but it's not necessary. These aren't ownership units, these aren't condominiums. You know, it's not the end of the world if you don't necessarily have a garage in that space. But you have parking for one car per unit in yes. the lower level. Un underneath the building. Underneath. And what we thought is we would eliminate some of those uh, spaces in the... Uh, the Could level. you go to the larger site plan? Yeah, you want to go to the larger one? Which direction am I going? I keep going to the color one. The one you had up first. first. Yeah. yeah. Yep, right. You, I think yours was this right. a bigger yep, format. This. Do you want me to zoom it? Oh, he can zoom it. <coughs> Is that bigger, is that better? Yeah, that's better. What we're talking about, members of the commission, I'm Mark Abanath with Alexander Bogart's architects and planners for the project. What we're talking about is right along Maple here and here and then turning this corner of having facilities that are part of this residential community, i.e. facilities that they'll use to operate it, possible exercise area, social rooms, those kinds of things. We understand the goal of what the community is looking for here. This is a, a fantastic site to start what is going to eventually happen over time in the community along Maple and other areas ancillary to this. But at this point in time, in terms of actually putting mixed-use retail in, 
not wanting to speak for Stephen, but I, I think they want to gear this towards residential. But, and we've done this in the past, and we're working on a project in Birmingham right now that's a senior's residential where the community wanted the same thing. The first floor will be uses and designed along Maple and turning this corner so that when you look at it, the pedestrian scale, the change in materials, the glass, the facade will feel like that pedestrian oriented retail storefront. And yet it'll be uses that'll be ancillary to the residential development. So that it will set that visual and architectural precedent that the community's looking for and still work with the market that they're trying to hit and with the uses that they're trying to and would need for this type of community. So that's really the goal as to what we're proposing with these buildings. In terms of the site plan, I just want to give you a brief on what we did. Uh, once again, the scale of these buildings being five stories, first floor parking and residential above, we wanted to, we pulled the buildings as close as possible to Maple. We had some preliminary discussions with Ben and Brent about not only the architecture and the scale along that street front, but what we could do to give it more of an urban walkable feel. And that's the intent of the overall design was to be not auto oriented, but pedestrian oriented, which is what we think the community is looking for. So the detailing across this frontage is actually street trees, street lights, in street, uh, street tree grates, paralleling right along the road, and then adjacent to that, a walk. So we're talking about potentially five feet of, of <coughs> extra concrete, street trees, street lights, and grates, and then seven feet of walk. Off of that, all of these list of items, we have areas that are expanded beyond that for benches, bike racks, seating areas, those types of things that you would normally see along that type of pedestrian oriented retail frontage with residential or office above it. So that this is kind of a hybrid that fits what we think this community is looking for. And not only taking that here, but turning the corner. And then if we're talking about linkage down along Axtell doing that to potential future development. In terms of, um, as I said, trying to make this pedestrian oriented and not auto, what we did is we and we come through the two buildings, we've opened it up to a court. All of these walks, this is all architecture here, not cars. We have along this facing of parking, a low 36, 30 inch high brick wall with stone cap to it, with hedge, as well as street trees. All of these walks link to the walks that are in front of the buildings here. So that when you're either out along Maple or when you first enter the project, what you're looking at is basically architecture and pedestrian orientation. There has to be, this This is still an auto-driven area. We want to do both. We have to provide the parking for these people, but we also want the presentation to be pedestrian oriented. So we've done that in terms of all this walk networks and put the parking on what we're calling the backside. So if you were to flip this building and pull it up on Axtell, which you'd lose that whole synergy of this large court area. That's the other thing that we've talked about. If I was to master plan this whole area, I wouldn't just have building after building after building all rode up. To me, that's not, there has to be a comfort level and a relief between architecture and open space and park. When you look at any urban community, they're all framed around buildings that might run on rows along grids, but then you come to nodes, you come to park areas, and that's what we're doing here. We're starting an entire master plan for an area along Maple and what might happen back in here. And if we were to continue this down, we might have some buildings that would continue down along the road, then we'd have another node and buildings that would continue along the road. So this is the start of that. And with the scale of the building and the trying to have both pedestrian and vehicular we think this park is a very key component to this with the scale of the buildings and having some green space. So um, that's really the, the gist of why the site took this development as opposed to a solid grid having five story buildings just running down a road at this point in time wasn't the way we wanted to go with it. As Stephen mentioned, we have other alternatives here. We're open. The whole point of this is to have a dialogue with you and go from here and have a better understanding of what your ideas are on the project. 
we're just here to show you what our thoughts are on it. So. Thank you. My, my real point was this, the transit center looks to mixed use. Mm -hmm. This is only housing. Mm -hmm. This is not anything else. Correct. That's why I thought that uh, Mr. Carlisle's proposal or uh, suggestion that there be some retails, particularly along Maple Road. I think you're missing an opportunity. Could better been, could be a coffee shop that everybody would use. You know. So uh, that was it. Any further uh, comments from the commission? Yes, Ms. Cruz. Um, I would be curious to know your position on item number four that uh, says all seven buildings are the same. The app applicant may consider incorporating one or two more housing types to break it up. What is what is your position on that? Because I um, find that very interesting. Than to have yeah, um, I'll tell you, if this was a for sale project, I would definitely agree with you. But I'm concerned with what my surrounding is. Um, it's a great location, A plus. So when somebody's renting or somebody's, they're not owning it, they're saying, you know, I can, that, you know, the spec that the semi pulls out of the truck or the bay across the street, or, you know, I don't think those, some of those industrial uses are gonna go away so quickly. And that would concern me as a buyer, making an investment in and buying, but somebody who's renting and looking at it, well, this is convenient, this is very nice, I like it inside, I'm not so concerned about my neighbor. Um, I think that we feel that that's uh, probably the appropriate way to do a bunch of different rental types I don't think would make a lot of good sense. Uh, so what, you know, we're really trying to cater to a market where there's no stairs, um, where it's very easily accessible for individuals, you know, and it, I'm a little torn about the mixed use. I, I really would like to try to create the look of commercial. I mean, we were even thinking, you know, we might have some attorneys here that maybe want to meet with a client and have like a work, live work type situation where they can book an office or a room downstairs and somebody comes. Um, but you have a lot of commercial there already. I just would hate to see a small retail space that has a revolving door with a four lease sign this week or next week, or there's not enough parking for the people that are coming in because you know you, we have to have the parking for the residential. So I, it, it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense just to put that use in there to make the use, I think, with what we've got surrounding it, and that we can make the appearance of having that type of use in that building. I'm all for that. Um, and maybe getting creative, because I really kind of like the idea of being able to have an office for somebody that's in a smaller flat apartment. They maybe need to meet with their attorney or something, and they don't want to do it in their unit. They could book a room or a camp, you know, and make it look like a, a business center, you know, we're, we're a little more commercial. And then inside, if we're giving up some of those spaces, because the way this is laid out is there's parking on each side of the garage, so basically you would lose one side of that parking to create that space. It'd probably be about a 20-foot depth space along Maple Road that we could do something, whether it's a workout facility, a gym, offices, things like that, we, we could do that and create some spaces inside in between. So if they have one or two or three people that are coming in, but I'm just afraid a coffee shop first thing in the morning, people are leaving for work, you know, you're gonna have to provide a lot of parking for, for those people. I mean, I'm happy to give all the free coffee away downstairs in the front, people can come in. And we, on the, one of the elevations, I don't know if we can uh, click over to the corner uh, elevation, Don, if you're no. driving. It was the first of the uh, renderings of the buildings. So am I going up or down? Um, right there. Uh, what, you know, the way that kind of shows us on that corner, that's X tall off to your, rough, off to your distance there on the right side of the drawing. And you see that inside of that building and then the other building comes out. Um, it does, it gives it a little bit of relief along the road. And if you look at the, where the buildings are located in the drives of those industrial buildings across the street, I don't know if you wanna just, it might, a little relief might be good because of some of the activity. I would love it if we could do parallel parking along that street. I don't know if that's something, you know, engineering would entertain, but that would certainly 
maybe make it a little bit more pedestrian looking, we would be more than happy to um, redo the curb along there and create some additional streetscape. I'm sure, you know, parallel parking on Maple Road is just not going to happen. Um, even if we did some retail where you could pull in kind of like a Birmingham where you could pull in front of the door and make it, you know, somewhat convenient. Um, but, you know, it really is our goal uh, on that corner, maybe create some outdoor space with some umbrellas and things that are put out in the summertime to try to create that where people from the buildings um, can gather and use it. And, um, you know, we, we try to pull those buildings up to the, up to the road. Or, uh, I think they have a really nice look. I think it'll really be uh, a nice addition to the corridor and really start to set the tone for the pedestrian. But to get that mixed use, we're putting this a new use in a mix of already existing mix, you know, uses. So this really doesn't exist uh, there. Um, so that's Mr. Craig. Yeah. I, I was recently in Atlanta at the American Planning Association's National Conference, and uh, I was on tours to at least seven different developments, roughly about this size. Some were a little larger, and I was really excited about what I saw there and they took and another I at some point I mean I'm even offering at some point if you would like I could send you a, a little disc to show yeah, you no, that take a look at it uh, but they were really creative there as far as layouts integrating different types of buildings to make it look more like a neighborhood a little teeny town as opposed to oh just another complex and I'm getting the feeling of you know it's a nice looking building. I'm not knocking the, the architecture, but it just looks like, okay, we've got this one idea and we're just going to cookie cutter stamp it on this lot and there we go. It's not a town. It's not a, it's, it looks like a more of an, you know, I don't want to, again, knock the aesthetics, but it feels more institutional than neighborhood. And I just thought maybe if I, I could show you, I could get your card later. I could just give you a disc and you could look, review those ideas. Sure. <clears throat> Anyone else have comments or questions? Yes, Ms. Cruz. Um, ben has also made other suggestions concerning um, the landscaping. And so if you find that it's more effective for you to create rental units that are similar you know, or identical in style, might you be able to add some pizzazz and razzle dazzle with your, your landscaping? Could oh, you make some investment there to ab make it Absolutely, you can count on that. I mean, we really didn't take it to the extreme level of a detailed plan, but we'll have a uh, very strong landscape and landscape plan with, you know, I'd like to have some unique plannings that, um, you know, just get somebody that can do a good urban style strong landscape. I think that's very important. Especially with what we have surrounding us. Um, because we really want this to stand out when you drive by and to look sharp, not just you know, your typical look in the landscape. I think the streetscapes that we can create along the street with, with any type of ornamental um, units that would go around trees and uh, benches and things like that. I think that uh, in street lighting, if we, you know, there's really no corridor plan that's set up, but if we can at least start to set the tone for some really neat lighting. So at night when people drive by and everything's dark, this is really going to, you know, stand out. And I think lighting is going to be very important in lighting the buildings from the road. And, but certainly we will, um, I can assure you, we'll, we'll put great effort into that. Thank you. What, uh, what do the floor areas uh, range from? Um, they range, um, square footage, I have to look on the point, but 900 up to about 1,400 square feet. Okay. You know, granite tops, upgraded plumbing fixtures, things that are, um, uh, you know, high quality, stainless steel appliances. And, and, you know, and one further question regarding the, uh, the parking. With 252 units, I believe it was, but um, what what do you, what do the uh, residents do about visitors? Is there any visitor parking? Um, well, there's um, 
it's about for each unit there's two spaces. Oh, two. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. But those are spaces. And some people will have two cars. I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure. Right. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> if we could get some relief with some parallel parking along um, Axtel, that would be great. In the evening, you know, and I think the demand for those can be probably more in the evening hours. Right. You know, and the businesses aren't functioning as much, and those semis aren't, you know, pulling in and out of there, and maybe. <clears throat> Maybe there is a happy uh, median that we can come up with to, to do that. But uh, uh, I mean, I would hate to start putting more parking in there and, you know, impact into that green area. I mean, we may even look at putting some type of an amenity in there, like a glass house of some type, like a solarium type situation in the center. So when you do drive by, you look in and you see something really sharp. We really didn't design anything yet into that open space, but those are things that we certainly um, are looking for some feedback. If you think we should put some more structure or some other type of gathering amenity there, you know, we'll, we'll be back with a more formal plan with, just, you know, most of that. Well, I know we, we uh, really welcome uh, creative solutions, particularly for your court there, you know, that, uh, Public art or a fountain, some kind of water feature. I think that would be very. Yeah, uh, we could we could put some public art out in the front. I mean, I'd love to do that. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Yeah, you know, good. along the road okay. to really have it stand out. Well, Mr. Shaver, at least from my point of view, this is a welcome uh, project, and we look forward to working with you. Um, having a nine-acre site is really a gem in my, in my estimation. And particularly since it's located in the transit district, I would hope that you'd put in perhaps even more than the minimum requirements for bike, because I think these people are gonna ride bikes too. So. Um, I mean, it's that's close to Birmingham. Right, <laughs> that's right, that's right. Mr. Yes. Chairman, I guess I have to get on my soapbox again, and I apologize if I sound like a redundant story, but I really love to see some, you know, green infrastructure, you know, rain gardens, natural vegetation, uh, you know, some stormwater management features in here, water features, uh, something that's more naturally uh, that rather than the hard landscaping mowed lawns that, that, you, that you're proposing, you know, with um, a water feature, you know, something that is yeah. a little more natural, I think. There's an op opportunity for something, I think, in that front feature that stands back off of there. We could do something in a fountain or, or some type of water feature and then do some um, uh, different type of uh, foliage, landscape, yeah. some grasses. I don't, I don't know if you thought about the, the stormwater management on the site or not. Well, we, look, you don't want a, a basin like a subject. No, no, that's my whole point. You know, what, we're, what we would be looking at is since this is in such an urban area where there is a lot of mass and buildings around us, is that we would either look at enlarging our storm sewer system underground, doing a underground type system with a vortex, you know, be able to clean the water, do some separation of our roof water because our roof water is going to be a lot cleaner. Um, and maybe try to come up with something creative where we can separate some of this water so some of it doesn't have to go through pretreatment. Maybe some of it can, you know. Um, I guess I was thinking of more natural vegetation, yeah. vegetative type of filters, uh, you know, rain gardens, natural yeah, no, swales. I, I think we could do that with, you know, the, the runoff from the building, but obviously we're going to have to figure out a way to get it into a central area. I don't know if we're we're going to be real successful in doing anything that's going to have great impact on such a small site. And I think we, we, this, to be honest with you, the site is very expensive. Economically, the site has been through five or six different people looking at it, from everything from nursing homes to trying to do a larger retail, something in there, uh, trying to do assemblages, it just didn't work out. And the expectations of the land sellers, my density is sort of driving my economics. My, if I could do less and I could, and it would make sense, I certainly would. No, I think, going, you know, 
Do you think you could be creative and, yeah. and still do more? I think we can use some, some stone and some swales and try to maybe keep some of the stuff out of the pipe and maybe do some stone and rock and we'll have to look at that with our engineer. It's a relatively flat site, so I think we can we can do some. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate uh, yeah. seeing that yeah. those methods used in the, on this site. Mr. Tegel. Yeah, I'd like to just circle back to Mr. Krent's comments. Um, first of all, I want to applaud you. I think we have a great opportunity here to do something on a piece of property that uh, is going to be very key. Um, but I look, at, I look at the planning, I look at the buildings, and it is reminiscent of what I've seen before. And um, whether it's uh, different architecture on the buildings or if it's a little bit more creativ creativity to make it more like a neighborhood feel. Because I, as, as I envision myself driving into this, you know, I mean, it, although you've attempted to make it more pedestrian oriented with walks, it's really focused on the automobile. And I'm, I'm just concerned that, you know, it's, uh, again, the skin of the building is different. The skin of the building is modernized, um, but it's not all that different from other developments that I've seen, you know, as far as its planning. So I would like to really encourage you to, you know, think about that a little bit. Maybe you can look at some of the stuff that Mr. Krent will send you and see what we can come back with. Because I think, there, like I said, I applaud you. I think it's going to be a great opportunity. Um, but I just don't want it to be more of the same, even though the, even though the wrapping is different, you know. So. Yeah. It, that, that has a very urban look to it. I mean, there, is, there are ways to soften the looks. Actually, the building that... Um, uh, Alex and their group is building down the street has a more urban or more residential feel to it. Well, what I, I guess what I'm getting at, I look at the architecture of that building, and if you were saying, I'm putting this up on Long Lake and Coolidge, yeah, that's a perfect fit. But this is Maple Road. There's a whole different character down there, and I'm not nece just ne necessarily speaking of the industrial properties, although that starts to set the fabric of what is happening down there. You look at our transit center. You know, I mean, it's it's a very contemporary. It's I mean, it's a very nice looking building in my opinion, but I would like to see it be a little bit more appropriate for what Maple Road. Maple Road will never be a big beaver. Maple Road is going to have its own identity and its own character. And we've done some. There's been some studies done. There, I mean, there's been information put out on the website about what we're th the planning commission, the city's, the direction we'd like to see Maple Road go. So. Please look at that stuff and try to take that to heart as you as you relook at this. Thanks. Anyone else? If not, thank you very much. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I uh, understand your comments. We'll continue to work with uh, staff, and uh, hopefully, we'll be back here uh, fairly quickly with <coughs> something that'll. Yeah, we, we don't design. want you. We don't want you to miss the uh, the spring building season. So. <laughs> Yes. But I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, next item is uh, <clears throat> for public comment for items on the current agenda. Every question. And uh, seeing no one, number eight is uh, planning commission comment. And I think we'll start with Ms. Cruz tonight. No, Ms. Cruz has no planning commission comments today. So. Okay. Mr. Gottlieb. Just it was nice to see them present something that I think is in demand and that the city could utilize that uh, <coughs> an interesting project. Okay. Mr. Uh, Shepke. Uh, yes. Uh, it's that, that piece of land is a jewel. I like the... I like the concept of what they're doing down there, but it's it really uh, doesn't stand out. It, it's like the same old, same old. And I hope that they can get a little bit more creative on the buildings uh, because that <coughs> standalone piece of property there, there's not another one around like that. So uh, I'd like to see something really nice happen there. Mr. Craig. Well, I just hope that every morning I can wake up and go to a grand opening as grand as it was this morning. What a, what a start for the day. That was so exciting. Um, I'm just so delighted that the transit center is now open and functioning. Uh, it just made my day to be there. It was a real wonderful experience. I'm glad it's, it's come to fru fru fruition. Mr. Uh, Sanzico. Um, no comments. <clears throat> Mr. 
uh, Tegel. Yeah, I just, I, I guess I just want to reflect for a minute on the, on the discussion we had with the, uh, the prior, not this gentleman, but the uh, Penske. Penske project. Um, and again, we've had these discussions before where we talk a good game. You know, we have things in our ordinance. We want to, we want to try to accomplish things. And I just feel that this, this particular project was one, uh, and it was said by several of you, this is, this is Roger Penske. I mean, this is a big name. This is, there's a certain level of, of quality and prestige that goes along with this. And I just did not quite understand the explanation I received as far as the stormwater capabilities or the creativity of the stormwater. Um, and we've had the discussion about engineering, too. They, they look at it from an engineering perspective, not necessarily from, is this a creative solution to a stormwater management pro project or problem. So anyways, uh, I just think this was uh, an opportunity to say, look, let's see what you can do. Push back just a little bit and see if you can do a little bit better with what, uh, with what you've got. So uh, again, I, I wasn't opposed to the project, but it just was a, a pretty ho-hum solution to uh, going to be a lot of asphalt out there. Mr. Benson. Nothing. Mr. Wilkin, anything? The Transit Center opening today, really cool. I would say uh, I was there and a number of planning commissioners were there. I would guesstimate that there was between, Tom, what do you think, 150 to 200 people there? Yeah, at least, at least 200, 200 250. Yeah, yeah. so uh, there was, uh, I think there were six speakers. Uh, the weather was not that cooperative, but still it was pretty cool. But what was really interesting was um, f f when you hear people say, no one walks on Big Beaver. And, well, that, that's not true. People, my office is on Big Beaver. People walk on Big Beaver. It's not Manhattan, but people walk on Big Beaver. And you, others say the transit center never gets used. But while we were there, they, they played the national anthem. And there was literally, everyone was quiet, respecting the anthem, looking at the flag. And while that was ongoing, you could hear the person sing. And the only other sound you heard was suitcase wheels of people who were running across the parking lot because they wanted to make the train. Um, there was probably, what do you think, John, about 25 people that, that were there to take the train. Most of them going, people we talked to were going to Chicago. So it, it is exciting. It is being used. Um, building looks fantastic. It was uh, <laughs> such a well-organized, professional event. Um, I agree with you, Mr. Krant. It was uh, what a great way to start the day. It was fantastic, and I hope hope it's very successful. Um, in, in terms of this evening's uh, agenda, sometimes the planning commission has to do a little bit of heavy lifting, and you did a little bit of heavy lifting tonight. And sometimes you got to do it. That's all. <laughs> Carl, I no comment. Well, I too uh, was really pleased and I want to thank all the commissioners that uh, went to the grand opening today. I thought it was uh, really exciting. Uh, does anyone know, uh, was it, is the tape going to be available on, uh, on the uh, city's website? Because there were some really good comments made by the speakers and I didn't know, I didn't know if that's, uh, that's it. I, I talked to Sean from uh, who was there recording the event. He said he had a, I think he said he had three cameras there. Okay. And um, he said it's going to take a, quite a few days to, to edit it and get it all together. But he said give it about a week and it'll be, it'll be available. Okay. Yeah. I hope you'll let us all know what it is because I thought I was pleased with the comments of Brooks Patterson and I was also thought his comment about uh, what's going to be the future of the Birmingham loading ramp or loading site and I, and I also thought you know you said 20 to 25 people actually boarded that train if you had been boarding in Birmingham there's only three places over there to park so you would have had to find off street parking so no I, I think it's a step in the right direction and I think this new project uh, with uh, you know more intensive housing is, is, is really welcome and I look forward to that if there are no further comments. I, I, I may. Yeah, Mr. Sh Brent, could you give us an update on the fracking committee that you were convening? We've, we've got to do research on the, we've been, it took me a while to get direction from the city management to move on this and we're, we've been told we can move on this. So we've got to, we've got to do some research. I've been preoccupied with other, pro other projects, but uh, we've got to go ahead to start moving on this. Any timetables? I don't want this thing to drift like, a lot of things do yeah. when you get to work on things. Can I provide it at the next meeting? Can I provide a timetable? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yes. 
piggybacking on that, I, I think Rochester Hills is passing ordinances uh, right now. And uh, they're a city, they're not a township, you know, so uh, I think it's, it's an area that, of concern to a lot of people and uh, even residents too, so. If there's nothing further, then uh, we are adjourned.